It's mostly quiet on Muriel Court, but that wasn't the case in 1966 when Robert Sims, his wife Helen, and young daughter Joy found gagged, stabbed, and shot to death. Safer politically to leave it alone. Is there not a who killed the Sims family in Tallahassee, Florida on October 22, 1966? Check out the new podcast, Massacre on Muriel Court, an in-depth, serialized podcast about this cold case. Subscribe now on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Moronic is the word that comes to mind. He's accusing two top officials of a cover-up. Standing back there under the banana tree. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends and occasionally a creepy place. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, plus early and ad-free episodes, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And please be sure to check out our website. ParadiseAfterDark.com On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. And if you peruse the website, you will find a nifty little virtual tip jar there. So if you want to swing in there and drop some coin in there, give us a tip and we'll give you a shout on the show. Yes, and for the month of October, all of our tips from our tip jar plus our Patreon earnings are going to the Florida Disaster Fund, which is a nonprofit organization helping our own community who has been pretty devastated by Hurricane Ian. Yes, I, every day I deal with the public and I hear some horror stories. And we got one $200 donation from Anonymous. So Anonymous, great name, by the way. Yes. Great name, Anonymous. Thank, Thank you, you so much for helping Thank us you very with much. this good cause. So other than that, Lauren, is there anything else before we get started in the case? Actually, yes. If you have not gone to your favorite podcast player and subscribed to my new show, Massacre on Muriel Court, which just dropped on Saturday, this past Saturday, please do so. I've been working really hard on this for months and months and months, and I think it's great. So give it a listen. And if you like it, a little five-star review wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I love how you got that in there. <laughs> My shameless plug. Shameless sorry. plug, that's it. They sneak them in everywhere. Before we get started here, Lauren, I got to say, tonight's episode, you know, when we started looking into this, it really brought back a memory, and I could almost picture Robert Stack talking about this particular case and other missing children in the New Mexico area. And it just really boggled my mind because then I had to go back and watch the episode just to see what was portrayed on film back then, because that goes back, you know, some time ago where they did interviews. So with that being said, you want to go ahead and get this kicked off? On the morning of September 20th, 1988, at 9.30 a.m., 19-year-old Tara Calico left her home in Belen, New Mexico, to go for her daily bike ride. She joked with her mother, Patty, before she left, saying if she wasn't home by noon to come look for her. She had a tennis date with her boyfriend set for 12.30 that day, and she didn't want to miss it. Before leaving home, Tara had even laid out her tennis attire for the early afternoon match. She took off on her normal bike route along New Mexico State Road 47. It was about a 25-mile ride. Tara and Patty used to do this ride together daily, but several weeks before, Patty began to opt out of the bike rides. 
Some drivers along New Mexico State Road 47 began to harass the mother and daughter. Sometimes it was catcalling. Other times, Patty felt somebody was following them. But Patty couldn't stop Tara from continuing the ride. She tried to get her to carry pepper spray, but Tara laughed that off. Well, noon rode around that day, and Tara was nowhere to be found. Patty did indeed go looking for her as she requested. She drove the usual bike route, expecting to find Tara with a flat tire or worse, hurt somehow. But Patty found nothing, so she drove back home. Patty called around to the local hospitals to see if Tara had an accident and had possibly been admitted. None of the hospitals had any record of her. Patty then rounded up family and friends to help her search. When they still came up empty, when they still came up empty-handed, Patty called the police. Officers arrived at the home and found Patty a wreck. Despite Patty's pleas and promises that there must be something wrong, her daughter would never just disappear like this. The police told her that Tara was an adult. She was allowed to go missing. Tara had class at the University of New Mexico, where she was a sophomore, at 4 p.m. that afternoon, and her books were in her bedroom. She didn't come home for her school supplies and didn't show up for class. The authorities finally started to take her disappearance seriously, and an investigation was launched into Tara's disappearance. Within five hours, Tara's name was entered into the NCIC as a missing person with a notification that foul play was feared. I wonder if the foul play was feared would boost the importance of the case. I think so. It would yeah. like it would it would increase some of the awareness of it to where it would be broadcast more through the news media or get more law enforcement involved. Right. I would assume so. Well, the following day, search groups began walking Tara's bike route. They walked both sides of State Road 47. This area was, for the most part, desolate with very little shrubbery or trees around. And finally, someone found a cassette tape, one that Tara had been listening to when she took off on her bike ride the day before. They then found a piece of the cassette player, specifically the window of the player. Now, off the right shoulder of the road, in the soft sand, there was a fresh bike track that indicated that someone had swerved suddenly. But that was it. There was nothing more. I mean, not even her pink huffy bike was ever found. Investigators looked into Tara's personal life, looking for any reason why she might want to run away. Tara Lee Calico was born on February 28, 1969, in New Mexico to parents David and Patty Calico. Tara had five siblings, and her parents separated when she was little. Her mother remarried, and she moved with Patty and her new husband, John Dole, to Belene, a suburb in New Mexico where the family settled. At the time of her disappearance, she lived with her mother, Patty, and her stepfather, John. She did very well in high school and had a lot of friends. No history of any bullying or any trouble there. As mentioned before, she was a sophomore at the University of New Mexico and studying psychology. Tara was described as very adventurous, but organized, fiercely independent, and outgoing. She loved the outdoors. Tara had a great relationship with her boyfriend, Jack. There were no red flags in Tara's life, past or present. Her family and boyfriend were almost immediately cleared from having anything to do with her disappearance. Valencia County, where the small town of Balin was located, was larger than the state of Rhode Island and inhabited by about 45,000 people and, of course, has plenty of vast and empty land. According to the Albuquerque Journal, Shallow Grave and body was dumped, were phrases that appeared frequently in their newspapers and crime stories in the area. Now, in 1988, the year Tara disappeared, violent crime had surged in Valencia County. Violent attacks and murders, typically drug-driven, seemed to take place weekly. It was actually a 300% increase in homicides from the year before. That's huge. Yeah. The recent violence in the area and the area where Tara disappeared made people think that she was buried in a shallow grave somewhere out there. Searchers looked through the desert. An extensive search lasted two weeks. Crews and helicopters, trackers with bloodhounds, Air Force and National Guard troops, state police, search and rescue personnel. They all searched for Tara and they all found nothing. And detectives with the Sheriff's Department interviewed seven witnesses who reported seeing Tara riding her bike northbound 
toward her home that day. Now, five of those witnesses saw an old, light-colored, probably Ford pickup truck with a camper following Tara at various points along the highway. All of these witnesses told police they saw her wearing headphones and appeared unaware of anyone behind her. Now, keep in mind, when we say headphones, we're talking about not earbuds and you know, the AirPods, these are like headphones that you'd have to put on. That From covered, 1988. Exactly. Yeah. That covered your ears. And they did a pretty good job of killing most of the sound. So when you're wearing them, especially on a roadway, you're going to have them cranked up. So it's possible that, yes, she was riding and was not aware of anything else around her. Yeah. Remember, she rides this path all the time. Right. Now, the bike tracks going off the pavement in Tara's cassette And the window to her cassette player were all discovered one to three miles south of where Tara was last seen riding north towards her home. The case began to dominate the headlines and quickly became the biggest story in the state. Tara's family used the publicity to their advantage and encouraged people to join the efforts to find Tara. And Tara's family and friends waited and waited, but no more evidence was found. It's like Tara had just dropped off the face of the earth somehow. Hey everyone, guess what? What? Paradise After Dark will be featured in the month of November in the True Crime Calendar. There's a True Crime Calendar? Yes, you can order it on podcastcalendars.com and use our promo code PARADISE for 10% off. There's also a pre-sale going on from now until November 30th for an additional 10% off. That is awesome. You know what? That would make an awesome Christmas gift. I know, right? Christmas is coming. So everyone, podcastcalendars.com. And use code PARADISE. A disturbing clue surfaced thousands of miles away on June 15, 1989, nearly nine months after Tara Calico's disappearance. A mysterious Polaroid picture was discovered in a convenience store parking lot of Junior Food Stores in Port St. Joe, Florida. Of course, Florida. The creepy photo showed a teenage girl and a young boy lying on sheets and pillows. The space they occupy is cramped and poorly lit. The only source of light seems to come from behind the photographer, The photo could well have been taken in the back of a windowless van with the side door pulled open. Both people in the photo have duct tape over their mouths and appear to be bound. Both are looking directly at the camera with terror in their eyes. The girl has a noticeable scar on her leg. The woman who found the picture immediately called the police, telling them that a white Toyota van had been parked in the spot just before she got there and a man with a mustache who looked like he was in his 30s had been driving it. Police staged a roadblock to intercept the vehicle, but the attempt to locate either the vehicle or the driver proved unsuccessful. Well, this well, this particular Polaroid caught the attention of local media and ended up becoming a national news story. The photo was broadcast on a current affair in 1989. Patty was contacted by a friend who had seen the show, The girl in the photo looked very much like Tara, and the young woman in the photo had the right hair color and complexion. So this is obviously going to prompt a phone call. A discolored patch of the young woman's right calf corresponded to a scar Tara had received in a car accident. In addition, a paperback copy of V.C. Andrews' My Sweet Audrina, said to be one of Calico's favorite books, can be seen lying next to the woman. The book is one of the things that usually pops up in most discussions because it's very evident and it can be seen. Right. Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and concluded that the woman was, in fact, Calico. But a second analysis by Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed with the Scotland Yard's analyzation. Well, an FBI analysis of the photo was found to be inconclusive. Nonetheless, Patty believed wholeheartedly that it was Tara in the photo. Which makes sense because you you want to have that hope right? that your child's alive and this is the closest thing that you're able to come to. The other child in the photo was almost immediately suspected to be a young boy named Michael Henley, 
also of New Mexico, who had disappeared in April 1988. Michael Henley had vanished a mere five months before Tara, just 45 miles southwest of Belen in the Cibola National Park. According to an article in Crime Magazine titled The Polaroid, on April 21, 1988, Michael Henley of Milan, New Mexico, disappeared on a camping trip in the Osso Ridge area of the Zuni Mountains. Henley's father and a family friend had brought the nine-year-old with them to hunt wild turkey. About 20 minutes after their arrival at the campsite, while the adults were busy setting up, Henley vanished. It seemed likely he had wandered away from the campsite and got lost in the rough, craggy landscape. Henley's father quickly reported him missing, but the search was halted by a sudden high-altitude storm. 400 volunteers, state police officers, and National Guardsmen clambered through the wilderness within a 10-mile radius of the campsite, scouring every inch. Civil Air Patrol volunteers crisscrossed the sky during daylight hours, coordinating by a cadre of local ham radio operators. Tennis shoe tracks were found in the snow, but as the Rosewell Daily Record reported, several searchers in the area were wearing shoes with soles similar to the boys'. There was no way to know if trackers were closing in on the missing child or wasting crucial time retracing areas that had been searched already. There were searchers walking over searchers in some area. Roger Robb, the search field coordinator, told reporters, We have scent over scent over scent. Rescuers posted signs along every stretch of asphalt in the vicinity. This way... Michael stay on the road in hopes that they might point Henley to their base camp. That's a really clever idea that I have yet to hear of any other time except in this case, where they're like posting signs and directions like, hey, Michael, go this way or that way. So as they're searching, they're also giving him. If he were to be lost out there, yeah. They're giving him an out like, hey, you know, hey, we can't find you, but if you come across this sign, at least we can send you in the right direction. I've yet to hear of this in any other search except this particular case. Well, the intensive search lasted more than a week, but yielded no clues as to what had happened to the boy. Well, about the photo, the majority of the family believed that that's Michael, the boy's father said. Michael's best friend believes that's Michael. His sister believes it's Michael. But Michael's father himself felt unsure. I don't know, he said. Maybe it's just because I don't want to see my son like that. Tara's mother and both of Michael's parents flew to Florida to speak with Port St. Joe police and examine the Polaroid firsthand. After a couple of hours discussing the case with investigators and scrutinizing the Polaroid, all three came away convinced that the photo showed their children. Strange as it may seem, I would thank him for keeping her alive, Patty told the Associated Press. I would thank him for taking care of her. Seeing that she's fed, seeing that she's clean, I hope he values her life as much as we do. Despite what might have been a major break in the case, the release of the photos and its frequent airing on Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, and even Oprah stirred up a lot of commotion, but no solid leads. Well, I can just imagine the hope that this family would have that, you know, like I said before, that they're just seeing it. And they want to believe right. so badly. Well, this brings us to June of 1990, where the case took an abrupt turn. A rancher riding a fence line discovered a scattering of bones. The remains were those of a child, and they were six or even seven miles from the campsite where Michael Henley had disappeared more than two years earlier. And scraps of clothing found at the scene were consistent with what Michael was wearing when he vanished. Five days later, the Cibola County Medical Examiner identified the remains as those of Michael Henley. So with that being said, we know for a fact that he's most likely not the boy in the photo. According to the Crime Magazine article, once Michael Henley was taken out of the Polaroid equation, the identity of the young woman it showed became problematic. If the boy wasn't Michael, the only solid link to New Mexico... What were the chances that the young girl was actually Tara? The girl in the Polaroid certainly looked younger than a woman of 20, and her face was narrower than the most recent photos of Tara. 
The mark on the girl's right calf was far from distinct as a scar. Thousands of young women read novels of V.C. Andrews. She was very popular at that time. But Patty's conviction about the Polaroid was never shaken. She always believed that it was Tara. Two other Polaroid photographs, possibly of Tara, have surfaced over the years. The first one found near a construction site in Montecito, California, and is a blurry photo of a girl's face with tape covering her mouth and light blue striped fabric behind her. Similar to that on the pillow in the van photo. It was taken on film that was not available until June of 1989. The second shows a woman loosely bound in gauze, her eyes covered with more gauze and large black framed glasses, with a male passenger beside her on an Amtrak train. The film used was not available until February of 1990. That was pretty clever to determine the manufacturing of the film so that way they could go ahead and remove those as possibilities. You know, that really helps with the investigation. Well, the, I don't think that they were removed as possibilities. I think that they just gave a timeline of when the photos were taken. So maybe Tara was still, she was abducted in 1988. And they know that if it's Tara in the photo, that she was definitely alive by February of 1990. That's a very good point. You know, I didn't think of that. that that's a great thing to point out because I, I was thinking that. It couldn't possibly be her because of the date, but you're absolutely right. It could have been taken later on down the road right. when the film was available. That's a good point, Lauren. That's a very good point. Well, sadly, you know, this is a tough thing for the family to have to do, but in 1998, which is 10 years after Tara's disappearance, the family had her legally declared dead. And in 2003, Patty and John Dole finally left New Mexico behind for a new life in Port Charlotte, Florida. It's not too far from us. Here, there's not anything I can do that doesn't remind me of Tara, Patty told the Albuquerque Tribune as she was preparing for the move. It will be a good change for us. But the move was not easy and it did not represent any abandonment of hope. It's really hard to move, she said. If she were to come home, I, I could not ever tell her we gave up on her. Well, sadly, Patty passed away after a series of strokes in 2006 and she never found out what happened to her daughter. A new development emerged in 2008 when Sheriff Rene Rivera of Valencia County, New Mexico, who had worked as the case's lead investigator in 1996, said he knew what happened to Tara Calico and who did it. He didn't name the suspects, but said they were two men, teenagers at the time of the disappearance, who were following Tara on her bike when some kind of accident happened. In a panic, they disposed of her body. But without remains, Rivera said he couldn't make any arrests. Tara's stepfather, John Dole, said the sheriff should not have made these comments if he was not willing to arrest anyone and that strong circumstantial evidence should be enough for a conviction. Sheriff Rivera left office in 2011 without making any arrests. You would think if he had some idea of who it was, you make the arrest, and then you try to talk to them, get some confession or get some information. Maybe maybe they could point you in a direction. So you would think if he was going to say that, that there would have been an arrest. That's what I find a little frustrating here. I don't know why he would say that, though, if he had – if it wasn't true. Precisely, and that's what I'm leading to is if, if you feel that way and you know this information, you make the arrest, you get them in the room, and you try to do what – police do and get information from them to where maybe you could have find Tara, could have found Tara. You know, you find leads so you get them there. Even if they're not the suspects you're looking for, maybe they have information that maybe got your mind thinking that they knew more than they did. You know, that was kind of my point when looking into it. This is a frustrating situation. Well, in 2013, there was a man named Henry Brown and he made a deathbed confession to the police. He said that shortly after Tara's disappearance, he had been in the basement of a man named Lawrence Romero Jr. While there, he noticed what appeared to be a young woman's body wrapped in a blue tarp and buried in a makeshift grave. Romero, a man named Dave Silva, and another man with red hair told Henry that the body was in fact Tara's. 
They said that on the day of her disappearance, they, along with a man named Leroy Chavez, were in a truck when they noticed her riding her bike. While trying to get her attention, they accidentally struck her with a truck and abducted her. So I'm assuming they hit her with the truck and like, oh, what do we do now? They yeah. threw her in the truck. They took her to a gravel pit and then sexually assaulted her. And when Tara threatened to go to the police, Romero stabbed her to death while Silva, Chavez, and the third man held her down. They originally hid her body in a nearby bush. However, as searches began for her, they moved her body to the basement. Henry told investigators that they threatened to kill him if he went to the police. He also said that they got away with the crime because Romero's father, Lawrence Romero Sr., was the sheriff at the time. You see how this all kind of plays together? Yeah. Because this story seems awfully close to what the lead detective at the time was saying that he knew already. Right. And it's all intertwined in the sheriff's office. I'm just going to leave that there. He and the other men's parents also allegedly helped cover up the crime. So if truthful, this could explain where Rivera made no arrests in the case. Henry's account seems very similar to what was explained by Sheriff Rivera. Henry also told investigators that he believed the men later placed Tara's body in a pond near one of their houses. He also said that her bike had been disposed of at a junkyard. Another man came forward and told police that one of the suspects had confessed to him as well. Romero Jr. later committed suicide in 1991. Despite the testimony of the witnesses, since Tara's body has never been found, no charges have ever been filed against the other suspects. In October of 2013, a six-person task force was put together to re-examine the case, but no new evidence was uncovered during the investigation. In 2019, the FBI announced a $20,000 reward for precise details that would lead to the recovery of Tara or her remains. One of the things I liked that the sheriff announced when he said he was going to offer the reward, he said, we're going to put the $20,000 reward out there because sometimes people are motivated by money other than motivated by goodwill. Right. So in April of 2021, investigators on the case executed a search warrant on a house in Valencia County. The warrant is still sealed, so the circumstances and results of the search have not been publicly released. This is very encouraging to the family that still exists, I believe her sister, um, and the people who are close to this particular disappearance because that means they're still actively working the case. Yeah. That's what you always want to hear. So obviously anyone with any information is asked to call the FBI at 505 885-1300, or you can send the information online at tips.fbi.gov, or obviously you can contact the Volusia County Sheriff's Office at 505-866-2400. So that's going to be kind of it for tonight, Lauren. I think on this case, that's pretty much the information that, that tells the story of Tara Calico. But there's one thing that I have to ask you about. What's that? I mean, one of the issues that I have with all of the findings in this case is this particular Polaroid, which I'm sure anyone that's listening to this or was a fan of Unsolved Mysteries or has done any research or heard of this, has looked at this particular Polaroid of what was originally believed to be Michael and Tara. And if it's not Michael and Tara, then who are these two children? I mean, what happened to them? Is, is is this information, is there anyone else that can identify them? I mean, can we put this through some sort of facial recognition system? Well, you know the technology is getting better and better every day. So, I mean, I would love to see that picture put through some of the parameters that they have now. Yes, I, mean, I, I would too. I mean, I know at the time this picture circulated through numerous TV outlets. Right. You know, so I cannot believe that no one has come forward with any information as to who they are. So the photo in and of itself should create a whole other case because to this day, that boy or girl has never been possibly identified. Well, and I think I believe I believe that I heard something. It, it was a documentary or something I was listening to that that suggested that the boy in the film was Johnny Gosh, who was another pretty famous missing boy. Was that the correct time frame, though? 
It must have been. If. Because I thought that was much, much sooner. That would have been in the 70s, wasn't it? I don't know. So this particular theory, they said Johnny Gosh, which, man, that he would be he would have been a lot older. But the woman in the picture seems young, but I I I do believe that she looks um, several years younger than Tara Tara at her age. Johnny Gosh disappeared in 1982. Okay, so in the picture, that would have put him. A lot older than what the picture yeah, is. Yeah, I guess you're right. So, so it wouldn't have been Johnny Gosh. But you know that – and that's the thing that I'm getting at is it's one of these situations where the picture needs to be put back out there. I mean I think we need to recirculate this picture throughout the true crime community because I got to tell you that when you go to CrimeCon and you go to these events that we've been to and we talk to the people that you know we have the pleasure to discuss these things with – they take a super interest, and I mean, when they sit down with an extra hour on their hands, they're doing what we're doing, except they're just trying to find information on something for themselves. They're not trying to share it with anyone like we are, but they find something, man, and it's like a dog with a bone sometimes. So I would love to see this picture put up there, and I hope that when we post it on our social medias that some of you guys grab this and start digging into it and start looking at that picture and say, okay, who who could these possibly be? Yeah. You know, and that's kind of what we're and here to do. And remember that the photo was found in Port St. Joe, Florida. So it, it – This puts us right back into the Sunshine State. Yeah. You know, the dark side of the Sunshine State. Where is this picture? Who are these people? And it, it would be odd to me that this picture would not have been known by the people that were in it. So I've read in some of the Reddit posts that this picture – um, was sort of staged. It was posted there for this particular situation or it was staged this way. I, it, there's so many different avenues that I've it, read it as a whole anyway. It's a yeah. rabbit hole in and of itself. But a lot of people say it was staged. It was an act. It was a, a film. You would think that if that were the case, that the people that were in the photo would say, oh, yeah, that was me and this is what we were doing. Right. Yeah. I would love to see this thing blow up again and – Go through the channels of social media, not just Oprah and A Current Affair and Unsolved Mysteries, but love to see this broadcast throughout the, you know, the social media community again and see if we can't put an end to who these people are. Well, I will be definitely posting it on our socials. And if you guys could share, yeah, that'd absolutely. be great. Absolutely. Share it all around. Let's, let's get this photo out there and let's figure out who these people are or g at least give some direction. Right, so, exactly. Do you have anything else for tonight, Lauren? No. Did you want to add to this particular case other than where the hell is Tara and who are these other people in the photo? Yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah, so I guess that's going to be it for tonight, everyone. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawk media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And check out our website for links to all of our social media, the merch store, and much, much more. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And please make sure to subscribe to Massacre on Muriel Court on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. That'll really help me branch out and reach a wider audience. And that, folks, is the last shameless plug for tonight. So thank you, everyone, for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.